Hi, I'm Tanya Nicholson. I'm the Associate Dean of Midwifery and Women's Health at Frontier Nursing University, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Dr. Susan Stone. Whether as a practitioner, an instructor, a university president, a presenter, or an organizational leader, Dr. Susan Stone's professional career has been consistently directed towards supporting advanced practice nurses through advocacy, education, and innovation. As a nurse midwife herself, she has had a special focus on advancing the midwifery profession. She has served as the president of Frontier Nursing University since 2001 and is currently serving as the president of American College of Nurse Midwives as well. Dr. Stone's influence is, influence is felt every day in our profession. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from SUNY College of Technology and that launched her career, which included serving as an obstetrical supervisor at Little Falls Hospital in Little Falls, New York, and then as the program director of the prenatal care assistance program at Bassett Healthcare in Cooperstown, New York. She earned a master's in nursing administration from SUNY College of Technology, followed by a post-master's certificate in nurse midwifery from Frontier. She went on to earn her doctor of nursing science from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. While practicing as a certified nurse midwife at Bassett Healthcare, she continued her affiliation with Frontier. She served as course faculty, regional course coordinator, assistant clinical director, program director of the community-based nurse midwifery education program, and then as dean. In 2001, Dr. Stone became the president of FNU, and she served dually as the president and the dean before she relinquished the dean duties in 2014 so she could focus solely on her role as president and as a leader in the healthcare community. Dr. Stone has been active throughout her career in a, nor in a number of organizations. In addition to her current role as the president of ACNM, she was the 1999 recipient of ACNM's Kitty Ernst Award. She was recognized as an innovative, creative endeavors in midwifery practice in women's health care. She was inducted as a fellow at both ACNM and the American Academy of Nursing. And other honors include the 2011 American Public Health Association's prestigious Felicia Stewart Advocacy Award. This award recognizes individuals who have demonstrated a strong commitment to advocacy on behalf of reproductive health and rights. Dr. Stone has made it central to Frontier's mission to diversify the student body. And throughout our growth and innovation, Dr. Stone has kept the university on a path of commitment to the mission of educating advanced practice nurses and midwives to serve in rural and underserved area. This model of distance education allows nurses to learn while continuing to practice in the areas where they live. The ultimate goal is to expand and diversify the primary care workforce, thus helping to fill in the gaps in accessible healthcare that are prevalent in so many rural and underserved populations. Her devotion to this goal and her leadership at Frontier has resulted in tremendous growth. In 2001, we had 200 students and now we have more than 2,000. Additionally, more than 6,000 Frontier graduates practice in every state in the U.S., as well as several foreign countries. I know you can see that her leadership has been critical in improving health care for families across the country who now have increased access to quality health care. Tonight, we are so excited to hear Dr. Stone's thoughts about how to build a diverse midwifery workforce in an effort to improve maternity healthcare outcomes. I'm pleased to turn this session over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Susan Stone, to inspire and inform us on this critical topic. Dr. Stone. Hello, everyone. I wanna welcome you to our digital summit and happy Nurse Midwifery Week to all of you. I know how hard you work and I love that we get to celebrate uh, the work that we do together uh, at once a year like this. And so thanks for coming to listen to this presentation today. I'm going to talk to you about um, building the midwifery workforce. Some of you heard me have heard me speak before about my agenda to increase the number of midwives. And I want to tell you today some of the reasons why that is so important. I know you know a lot of them already, um, but I'm going to put it all in context, hopefully, for you. So my um, discussion today is building a diverse midwifery workforce in the United States, focused on the United States today to improve our maternity care outcomes. So first of all, what is the problem? 
Well, the problem is that United States has increased maternal mortality rates over the last 25 years pretty dramatically. At the same time, we're spending money to improve our healthcare system. We don't seem to be making any strides in improving uh, maternal health care. As a matter of fact, we seem to be slipping backwards. In 1987, we had a 7.2 per 100,000 uh, death rate in the United States for women related to uh, childbirth. And by 2013, that was 17.3, 2015, 26.4. So this increasing trend of maternal mortality, which is just a signal, a terrible signal of what's happening in the rest of the healthcare system. So each year we're seeing approximately 700 women die of pregnancy related uh, causes in the United States. Along with that, the rate of severe maternal morbidity actually doubled between 2000 and 2010. And what does that mean? Women were sick enough to be admitted to an intensive care unit. And we have seen more than 50,000 um, women suffer from severe pregnancy comp complications as reported by the CDC. So here you can see that that climbing rate of maternal mortality um, between 1987 and 2013, and we haven't made any progress in the last five years either. The interesting thing is when you compare the United States to other industrialized nations, and you see that the other nations, their maternal mortality rate is uh, getting lower and lower, while ours continues to rise. We know that African women, African American women are three to four times more likely to die of pregnancy related complications than white women and women aged 30 to 39 almost twice as likely to die of pregnancy complications as women 20 to 24 and then we see that risk become even higher uh, after age 40. So why are we seeing this rising maternal mortality? We know in the United States, excellent care is available, available for some, but not for everyone. And studies have shown us that at least half of these maternal deaths in the United States are preventable. We have a shortage of providers, shortage of facilities. We have financial issues, bureaucratic issues, transportation issues, and language barriers. And we have care that is not consistently culturally appropriate or respectful. When we look at the medical reasons for the rise in maternal mortality, these are the highest rated issues. Um, hemorrhage, pregnancy related hypertensive disorders, infection, pulmonary embolism, cardiomyopathy and cardiovascular conditions. As a matter of fact, cardiovascular conditions are cause about 25% of the maternal mortality. Our CDCs uh, have studied this intensively. We see some of the factors related to health. Um, these are public health issues more, and nearly half of women are obese prior to becoming pregnant, and nearly half gain more than the recommended weight during pregnancy. And you all know the complications associated with obesity in pregnancy. As far as smoking, about one in five women smoked in three, the three months prior to getting pregnant and about one in 10 were smoking during the last three months of their pregnancy. And we also have a huge problem, as you well know, with mental health disorders. About one in nine women had symptoms of major depression and only about half of them received treatment for this condition. And so um, we have mental health issues and some of them result in suicide contributing to the maternal mortality rate. You know that this uh, cesarean section rate in the United States uh, hovers around 32 to 33%. And uh, CDC also looked deeply at this issue. Um, so what we see is the rates of maternal morbidity were higher for cesarean delivery than for vaginal delivery. Not very surprising, but here's the study showing that. This study that I'm talking about examined four morbidities, maternal transfusion, ruptured uterus, unplanned hysterectomy, 
and admission to intensive care unit. Maternal transfusion was the most common of the four morbidities, followed by ICU admission, unplanned hysterectomy, and ruptured uterus. What we know is that women having vaginal deliveries with no previous cesarean delivery had the lowest rates of all four morbidities. And women with VBAC deliveries had lower rates of all four morbidities compared with women uh, who had repeat cesarean deliveries. So we are seeing that we have got to lower this cesarean section rate. Right? This is very critical um, to improving our outcomes. We also have shortages in maternity care. We're seeing, we know that shortages of, of providers and facilities in maternity care just actually deny health care to women and their families. And in two, uh, 2013, there were approximately 3.93 million U.S. births, and we are projecting that to be more than 4.4 million by 2050. So we have a rising number of births expected in our country. And yet we know that 40% of U.S. counties have no midwife and no obstetrician. And ACOG has pr projected a shortage of between 15 and 21,000 OBGYNs by 2015. 2050, excuse me. So we are uh, seeing this uh, increasing number of births and decreasing number of providers, which is problematic. In rural areas, we have even heightened concerns as we're starting to see an accelerated rate of hospital closures. And, um, and even if the hospital stays open, oftentimes you see discontinuation of maternity care at, at these hospitals. Um, uh, rural areas are more likely to have health provider shortages and also rural areas have fewer options for health insurance coverage and provider networks. So what are some of the solutions we should be looking for? We need increased access to primary and preventive care. We need data collection. We need to be able to identify the reasons for the mortality and the poor outcomes so that we can develop the right programs to address these. We need to diversify the health provider workforce and we need to work collaboratively in team-based care um, so that we can make sure that women have the right provider and the right setting at the right time. And we need more midwives. So access to care, what does it really mean? First of all, there, the ticket to get into the healthcare system is insurance coverage. So um, that is very important, of course. Um, accessing a location where was the geographic availability and finding a health care provider whom the person trusts and can communicate with. So think of these three things, insurance coverage, geographic availability, and the personal relationship with a provider is very important. So we know that health care is shaped um, by a variety of social determinants. Um, the medical issues that I mentioned earlier extremely important. Those are the things that are actually killing women um, as, they, um, as they go through childbirth and beyond. But what are the things previous in our own um, United States and in our own communities that are affecting women's ability to be healthy and stay healthy and have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy life? So uh, think about access. When we think about access, it is more than just geographic. Um, we need to have enough providers. We need to have them located in a place that's accessible to women and their families. We need to have hours that are appropriate for uh, women. So if a woman works, we need evening hours. Um, if she can't come to the clinic till Saturday, we need Saturday hours. Uh, and we need a variety of pro providers. Um, we need the uh, families need the resources to make use of available uh, uh, services, again, insurance, and they need to know the uh, facilities are there and available to them. Uh, they need to have cars. Oftentimes, if they're in a rural area, they need a ride to the clinic. Um, in the uh, urban areas, they may be able to get uh, public transportation, but it still may be difficult if you have other children at home and those types of things. The appropriateness of the service provided includes the gender, 
continuity of care, confidential, confidentiality, perceptions of quality, and, and cultural sensitivity. So this speaks to women's willingness to go to a clinic or to a provider. Uh, women, uh, it has been shown that um, uh, race concordant care when a woman can choose who is going to be her provider, and not just race, but gender, uh, whatever that woman is most comfortable with, in the best healthcare system, we would have choices for women so they could choose a healthcare provider that they're comfortable with. Some women want a male provider. Um, whatever it is that they're comfortable with, we should be able to expand our expand and diversify our workforce so that they should have they could have choices to care. And, and this boils down to people are not going to come to you, feel comfortable divulging their healthcare practices and their lifestyle if they don't have trust and faith in, in the provider. We need accurate data collection. In order to solve the problem, we need to know what are the um, root causes of these problems. We need to collect accurate data identify the key problems and create programs to address those problems. And it was a great example in California when California Pregnancy Associated Mortality Review, it launched 10 years ago and it did a root cause analysis on every maternal death over several years. And most reviews identified some ch chance that the death could be prevented. Um, based on the results of this, they created toolkits to train providers and maternal deaths at hospitals that use the toolkits dropped 21%, while those that did not use the toolkits dropped only 1.2%. Uh, so this uh, ability to collect data state by state, and so some states have maternal mortality review committees, um, other states don't. There's no consistency state to state in the mortality review committee. So, um, the goal is that there would be a consistent maternal mortality review data collection in every state in the United States. And at ACNM, we are advocating legislation to assure maternal mortality review boards in every state. This is very important. We need to diversify the health provider workforce, and I talked about this a little bit already, but racial and ethnic minorities are underrepresented in our U.S. healthcare professions. And we know that diversity improves access to healthcare for underserved patients. Uh, as a matter of fact, studies have shown us that African American, Hispanic, and Native American providers are much more likely than white physicians to practice in underserved communities. And African American and Hispanic physicians, as well as women, are more likely to provide care to the poor. Racial and ethnic minority patients who have a choice are more likely to select healthcare professionals of their own race or ethnic background. And also, racial and ethnic minority patients are more satisfied with their care and more likely to report receiving higher quality care if they're treated by a healthcare professional of their own racial or ethnic background. This is no surprise. Once again, as I said, um, we are oftentimes more comfortable with people who know our own culture, who understand us when we're talking about our challenges in life, if they live in the same uh, cultural or the same community and understand those challenges um, on a deep basis. Team-based and collaborative care is really going to be so important in helping us solve this problem. No one type of provider can do this alone. And I really love um, ACOG's publication, Collaboration and Practice Implementing Team-Based Care. Um, ACNM and many other organizations participated in with ACOG in developing this. Um, I appreciate ACOG's lead on this. But there are some guiding principles in this document that say, first of all, we need to have patients and their families at the, at the center. Uh, uh, patients and their families, they need to be informed about their care. They need to be informed about any conditions that are occurring, and they need to be able to make choices. Um, and it's our role to help educate them so they can have the knowledge that they need to make a cho the choice that's best for them. But it, it, regardless, looking at these guiding principles in this document also, um, it's important that the team has a shared vision, 
and that each member of the team understand each other's roles. So it's important we talk about a lot about interprofessional education. The goal is that there's more knowledge about what a nurse midwife does, what a, C, a certified midwife does, or whether it's a nurse practitioner, a PA, um, a nurse anesthetist on the team, who, what's the obstetrician's role, um, and those kinds of things. So oftentimes you have physicians really have no understanding of what the capability and the background education is of a midwife. So it's very important that we uh, spend time educating each other about um, our scope of practice and really understanding each other as we participate together on teams. Uh, the next uh, guiding principle is that all members are accountable to themselves and to the team. So you are responsible for your own actions, but also responsible for making sure that the team uh, functions at a high level. Of course, effective communication is critical. It should go without saying, but oftentimes um, communication can be a key problem. And we see this in the studies of uh, patient deaths, um, not just related to maternal mortality, um, but other um, patient deaths when the root cause analysis has shown that when you get really right down to what the problem is, um, communication errors are huge, a huge um, portion of the cause. So team leadership is situational and dynamic. This is an important factor. So if you're working on a team, it depends uh, what the situation is, who the leader of that team is. So if you're in a birth center and everything is going well, then the leader of that team is most often the nurse midwife or the certified midwife. Um, if you're in an ICU with a very sick woman, then the leader of that team should be the um, perinatologist or whoever has primary care for that woman at that time. So, and uh, over the course of a pregnancy, the leadership of the team should be able to change according to the situation um, as necessary. So it's not just one um, leader of the ship, um, but it's whoever is the most uh, reasonable person at that point in time. It could be a public health nurse in a po postpartum situation who was making home visits. Uh, so situ leadership should be situational and dynamic. I really like this document, this collaborative care document, and I encourage you to, you can get it just by Googling it. Um, it's an excellent description of um, team-based care. So we need more midwives. Today we have about 14,000 nurse, uh, excuse me, midwives. Um, if we include certified nurse midwives, certified midwives, and certified professional midwives in the United States. Our total expected births, as I mentioned, is 4 million per year. We have an increasing number of midwives, but the progress is very slow. And we need to increase the number of midwives who are graduating each year. We know that in order to be a solution to this problem, there must be enough midwives. Um, we do have an increasing number of programs offering distance education, which seems to increase the numbers of um, midwives uh, uh, graduating from those programs. Uh, you know, of course, at Frontier Nursing University here, our current enrollment is approximately 900 uh, midwifery students. So this uh, agenda to try to increase the number of midwives um, is very important. Uh, one of the biggest problems, as you know, is obtaining clinical sites. So we need to look at uh, what is um, impairing midwives from being able to become preceptors. What are other options around simulation to possibly um, supplement the clinical experience um, and, uh, and see what preceptors really need and how we can help them um, to be effective and potentially take even more than one student in their practice, especially in these really big practices. Looking at a pro employment of midwives by state, you can see um, that although some states have uh, between 280 and 720 midwives, overall, when you look at this whole um, uh, country, you can see we don't have a lot of midwives practicing. And when you look um, uh, down, uh, 
to employment by uh, midwives by specific areas, you can see, um, as I mentioned before, more than uh, 40, 40 percent of counties in the United States do not have any midwives practicing at all. So why is it important that midwives should practice? We have a lot of data to support the safety and effectiveness of midwifery. Uh, the 2000 landmark Lancet series um, is such a good resource, uh, but it did report that over 50 outcomes are improved when you add midwifery care to the team, including lower preterm birth. And using a life save model analysis, over 80% of maternal mortality could be averted by universally scaling up midwifery, including family planning. And the high burden countries who've had a sustained reduction in maternal mortality over 20 years have had a market increase in midwifery investment. We know that CNMs and CMs are appropriate for prov providers for low risk pregnancy. The Cochrane re reviews showed um, that uh, concluded that most women should be offered midwife-led continuity models of care, although ca caution, of course, um, to women with substantial medical or obstetric co complications. Um, Women's Health Issues 2012, based on this systematic review, there's moderate to high evidence that CNMs rely less on technology during labor and birth than do physicians and achieve similar or better outcomes. And of course, the Lancet again, provision of accessible quality midwifery services that are responsive to women's needs and wants should be a part of the design of the healthcare service delivery system and should inform policies related to composition, development, and distribution of health workforce in all countries. So what is the impact of more midwives? We know that increasing the number of midwives will improve access to primary care, including maternity care, especially for women, uh, rural women and underserved women. Midwives play an important role in improving this shortage situation. We know that most women are able to have normal physiologic births and midwives are experts at low risk normal births. Uh, and again, in 2013, CNMs and CMs attended only 8.2% of all U.S. births, and midwives could independently attend a much larger proportion of those normal births, freeing obstetricians to use their specialized skills to assist women who have significant complications. We know that many other countries make a significant um, higher use of midwives than our country does. As a ma matter of fact, um, in the Typically in the developed world, there are 2.5 midwives per every obstetrician. And this uh, slide shows you that um, this is midwives per obst obstetrician in various countries um, with the highest in the um, UK uh, at about 20 midwives per obstetrician. And then you can see as that number goes down, down, down. Uh, and in the United States, it's about 0.2%. And then when you look at some of these countries and look at their maternal mortality per 100,000 births, and you can see the dramatic difference between the United States and these other countries. And this is the flip of that almost, when you look at the percent of births attended by uh, midwives, Finland, 78%, Iceland, 77%, uh, Sweden, 75%, and the US, um, 9%. So you can see the difference that more midwives can make on um, outcomes. Also, the same um, situation occurs, on, excuse me, is uh, apparent in infant mortality, although not quite as dramatic as the situation going on with maternal mortality. So Cochrane also published a review on August 22nd, 2013. Um, stating that midwife-led care results in better outcomes. Um, some of the better outcomes included less regional anesthesia, fewer episiotomies, fewer instrumental births, fewer cesarean sections, more continuity of care, fewer preterm births, less fetal loss between before 24 weeks, higher maternal satisfaction, and a trend towards cost saving. So, what is the downside? I don't, you know, we need to have more midwives. So obvious. So
So increasing the number of midwives can also help us increase the diversity in the workforce. Um, midwives with their um, public health background and um, focus on health can help women stay healthy. Um, they can help women with their issues around obesity and smoking and contraception. Midwives almost always decrease the cesarean section rate. If you add midwives to a practice, study after study has shown that. Um, midwives can be available to provide preconception care and interconception care so that we're helping the woman prepare for a pregnancy. And oftentimes midwives um, can really develop deep relationships with their patients. And this is a critical step in increasing access and improving health. Um, when women trust you and can tell you what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what their fears are, what's going on at home, um, those things, then we can uh, start to strategize to help them deal with these issues. So in summary, we know that the United States has increasing rates of maternal mortality and morbidity, and the associated factors include a lack of considered, concerted effort in data collection and analysis, uh, maternal obesity, other health issues that could be affected through better primary and preventive health care, um, as well as early identification and treatment of problems. Uh, of course, uh, once again, if, if it's hard to get to a, a healthcare provider or access a provider, um, you're going to be less likely to reach out before things get um, more dire than they need to be. Um, not enough health care providers, especially in rural and underserved communities, and we have too many cesarean deliveries. Um, we know that an increased number of midwives has the potential to dramatically improve these outcomes. So I hope that you will work with me and we can work all together uh, to uh, really make this happen. This is an important goal for us, an increased number of midwives. So thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to me email me at sstone at frontier.edu. Um, I appreciate you watching this presentation today and have a wonderful nurse midwifery week. Excuse me, a wonderful midwifery week. Thank you.